entrepreneurship is often born out of the ability to see opportunities other people don't see and seize on those opportunities. You know, a non-entrepreneurial personality sees an opportunity and then can give you 73 reasons why it doesn't make any sense to pursue it. Okay. And so an entrepreneur sees an opportunity and, and the more people that tell us it's not going to work and it's a terrible idea, the more motivated we get. So reconciling that personality type with being at peace is, it's, it's, yeah. it's not easy. And so I, you know, listen, part of it is just self care and self love. You just have to recognize that that's the way you're hardwired. And how can you do that from a position of calm and confidence and, you know, a willingness to admit mistakes? You know, some of the toughest lessons in life I've learned is I wanted to be right more than I wanted to be effective. And so I'm hanging on to something that I think I thought two years ago was a good idea and I'm unwilling to give it up because, because darn it, if I give it up, I'm wrong, you know? And so those are the kinds of lessons you have to learn to get to the point where you just realize, man, you're going to make a million mistakes in your life. Learn from it and move on. Say sorry to the people whose lives were negatively affected by your mistakes. Love yourself through it. Love other people through it. That's how you find it, my humble opinion. Hmm. Thanks for that. I'm curious about your, some of your biggest successes and biggest failures and how they came together. Well, we have time for the successes because the, <laughs> <laughs> that's a, not sure we have time for the failures. You know, I, I like to start with failure. So the, the decision to come up here to Minneapolis and run this little $7 million company was a, was a terrible decision. I've run the gauntlet of blaming it on everything other than just poor processing of opportunity by me. Just for clarity, that's that's not a EOS. This was a previous venture you were yeah, This was pre-EOS. I, 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 um, uh, I was helping run a, a small company in Columbus, Ohio, sales and service training company. We had a business partner up here in Minneapolis that uh, we did some co-selling and co-delivery with. And the owner of that company, uh, offered me an opportunity to come run her business. And it was an offer that was made publicly enough that I didn't have the luxury of time to, to think through it. And what I didn't think through at all was culture fit. And I, I'm smart enough to understand that culture fit is important, but the, the juiciness of the opportunity was so compelling that I, it was one of those deals where you see all the positives and you you negate all the negatives in your own brain. Yeah, and, yeah. and in hindsight, I'm, I'm just shaking my head wondering what the heck I was thinking. Great company, great leader. It just was a poor culture fit. What that company needed and what that founding entrepreneur needed and what I brought to the table were two different things. And if I had known what I know today, I would have been smart enough to ask questions and query and push back in, in areas where, where I just wasn't willing to go because I didn't want to talk myself out of this great business opportunity. I, I'm sorry. I just want to stop you on that point because that is a form of due diligence, no matter what, what would have those questions been? Yeah. And so one question I wish I had asked was define a dismal success or a, a dismal failure and a great success, 90 days, one year, and three years after I take over or join the team, okay? I wish I would have asked that. Another question is, what's your philosophy about leading and managing people? How do you identify great people? How do you convince them to join your team? And how do you get the most out of them? That was where the major cultural difference was. I've always been a big fan of Steve Jobs. A lot of people hire smart people and tell them what to do. We hire smart people and ask them to tell us what to do. And, and mm. that style wasn't the way this company had historically operated. It was more command and control. We've got an agenda here and either you're going to fit into it or we'll find somebody else to fit into it. I was a fish out of water in that environment. I don't know how to work that way. 
So that would be, yeah, I mean, culture change is just, that's a huge, huge issue in itself, but to take a command and control environment and turn it into one, which empowers the individuals to come forward and, and take risk and be yeah. wrong. Uh, it sounds easy, but it just, it probably in practice would not. It, it isn't. And I always, I always come off when I hear myself talk about this after doing a podcast, you know, I always feel like I come off as negated. There are very successful command and control leaders and organizations in the world. And, and I don't mean to belittle the, um, the mindset. It's just not my way. I prefer to empower people to do the right thing and manage to results, not methods. So anyway, that was the, that was the biggest business failure for sure. Yep. And it put my family at risk. It was a very difficult mistake to recover from. And quite frankly, I've spent 15 years attempting to recover from it emotionally and economically. And that's part of my journey to be at peace is, is, you know, when you, when you make, feel like you make a mistake that lets a lot of people down, including the owner of this business who, you know, I really liked and respected and trusted, you know, I let her down. I wasn't the person she wanted me to be. And had I done a better job that either I wouldn't have accepted the opportunity in the first place, or I would have gone in eyes wide open and been better prepared to succeed in that environment. And so, you know, that's where a lot of the soul searching comes from. Hmm. 